All of the Fretboard Journal podcasts are brought to you by a few presenting sponsors. First up is Martin Guitars. Martin Guitars and Strings remain the choice for musicians around the world for their unrivaled quality, craftsmanship, and tone. Then we have Carter Vintage Guitars over in Nashville, where guitar lovers go for a good time. And we have a brand new presenting sponsor, Calton Cases. Your custom instrument deserves a custom case. Thank you to all of our presenting sponsors. Welcome to the Fretboard Journal podcast. I'm Jason Verlindi, the publisher of the Fretboard Journal magazine. As always, that's John Rauhaus playing in the background. All throughout December and November of last year, I was doing a slew of interviews for this podcast. I was wondering which one I should air today. This is the week of virtual NAM. There's going to be a lot of product releases, but then... With the news of the passing of New York Dolls' Sylvain Sylvain, it became clearly apparent that the one guy I should air this week is return guest Night Bob. Night Bob, of course, famously worked for the New York Dolls. He also worked for Emerson, Lake & Palmer, Aerosmith, R.E.M., on and on, Steely Dan... And by popular demand, I was able to get him back on the podcast. We actually recorded this interview on Election Day in November of 2020. I hope you enjoy it. Before we get to it, a few housekeeping notes. We have a new sponsor, Isotope, the incredible audio plug-in for everyone out there who is recording either at home or in a studio. They have so many plugins that can fix your audio and clean up all those little mistakes that you made. Uh, If you go to isotope.com and use the discount code FRET10, F-R-E-T-1-0, you will save 10% off any of their software packages. Please go try their stuff out. It is incredible. And uh, if you are inclined to try their stuff out, you should know that we have a brand new podcast called The Truth About Recording and Mixing. It is hosted by Johnny Sangster. It is very much a play on the Truth About Vintage Amps podcast that I co-host with Skip Simmons. It's been enormously successful, and a bunch of people said, why doesn't this exist for recording and audio and mixing and mastering? So we started up a new podcast. It's one of several that we're going to be launching this year. The other question everybody has is, where's the Fretboard Journal? Fretboard Journal 47 is being printed right now, I'm happy to say. You know, when we are about to send an issue off to press, a whole bunch of us, four or five of us, proofread the issue, and it usually takes us a few days. And our main proofreader, Kim, reached out to me and said, did you guys run more stories in this issue or something? Because it's taking me a while. And uh, yes, we have some pretty meaty, text-heavy stories. We also have some really beautiful stories with lots of photographs. So Uh, I hope everybody will subscribe if they haven't yet. You're going to be seeing that in a few weeks. As always, it takes a while to produce these, and then they have to go to a bindery, and then they have to go to a mailing house where they get packaged in the fancy cardboard mailers that everybody has been clamoring for. So patience is always welcomed, but uh, if, if you are on the subscriber list or if you subscribe between now and the next week, we will make sure you are locked in and get that issue. And of course, we also have digital subscriptions, so you can subscribe that way and just get a PDF mailed to you whenever it is ready for you. As always, the Fripboard Journal podcast has a couple of sponsors. First up is our friends over in Canada at Folkway Music, Canada's premier acoustic and also electric store. Mark Stutman, frequent Fretboard Journal contributor. He's been on this podcast a bunch. One of our favorite authorities when it comes to vintage acoustic guitars. Check out their inventory. Even if you live south of the border, you're going to be informed and find some cool gear. We also are sponsored by our friends at Mono Cases. You can go to monocreators.com to see their entire lineup of gig bags and pedal board bags and studio monitor stands. You name it. I was just at Johnny Sangster's recording studio talking to him about that podcast I was just telling you about, and I saw a bunch of mono gear lining the walls. I think it's it was probably pedal boards from some band that was coming through. Um, they're the best in the business. If you are at all in the need of for protecting your stuff, you should check out what Mono is up to. And of course, last but not least, our friends in New York City at Retro Fret Vintage Guitars are also sponsoring this podcast. And I shouldn't have to remind you, but I know someone out there has the means to buy this guitar and should be buying this guitar. So 
they still have, for some strange reason, Ry Cooter's original Cooter Caster, the 1967 Teal Cooter Caster that was on so many amazing recordings. It is available for sale right now. They also, lower down on the financial rungs, have a beautiful blonde 1969 Telecaster and... Going further back in time, a 1937 Gibson HG00 that looks fantastic. Thank you to all of our sponsors. I will say, if we were at NAMM, we'd be handing out media kits to all of our existing and potential advertisers. And because this is a bizarro year, I made sort of the anti-media kit, and I had a lot of fun putting it together. It is very informative. It tells you the story of the Fretboard Journal. It tells you when our dates are and everything else. But it also tells you what we're all about. So if anybody out there works for a brand and wants to see the Fretboard Journal's anti-media media kit, reach out to me, podcast at fretboardjournal.com. All right, enough yammering from me. There's going to be probably a ton of NAM news between now and next week. Taylor's already announced that they are employee-owned now. Martin's already announced a David Gilmore guitar. Fender's already announced a bunch of models. So we're probably going to save all the guitar industry gossip for next week but right now let's listen to night bob sharing some gossip that stands the test of time and uh again one of my favorite people to have on this podcast one of my favorite people to interview ever i hope you enjoy this conversation please keep the feedback coming share the podcast with friends and leave us a review over on apple podcasts if you love it night bob you're back on the podcast thank you (laughs) Well, it's great to be here. <laughs> you, Very you, enjoyable. You, you regaled us with uh, a couple hours of stories the last time around. I'm <laughs> realizing, and some of our listeners have pointed out, that uh, we, we overlooked a few different things. Uh, we didn't talk much about the New York Dolls, so I want to have you riff on that chapter of your okay, life for a little cool. bit. Mm-hmm. Sure. All right. Um, I was aware of the New York Dolls when... Uh, in the early seventies, cause, uh, used to be in the pre-internet stone age, you would find out what was going on by, uh, picking up, uh, the village voice, right? I would make a run into New- I was living in New Jersey at the time. I would take the train into, um, Manhattan and I would pick up the village voice on the day it came out and the, uh, the British music, you know, melody maker, new musical express and sounds. Cause you could get them on a, at a newsstand, right? And then you'd sit down, have a slice of New York pizza and see what was happening. Right. And, uh, I would go right to, um, the, uh, entertainment section and I'd look at Fillmore East and see who was playing. If I had $20 in my pocket, I would walk over there and buy a couple of tickets for upcoming shows. Right. And in the village voice, I saw the, I saw an ad for this band. Right. And, um, it looked kind of, uh, kind of British, but not like kind of like a, a, a an LSD version of uh, the Rolling Stones. So I was kind of curious what they were up to. And I got this job working in New York City, running a rehearsal studio at night. And they were one of my clients, one of the clients that rehearsed there. And the main, their main residency gig was like two blocks away. So they said, you should come down, right? So I went and I saw them, right? And they were, um, let's just say they were, they were like, they were edgy. They drew a lot of girls. It was a fun, fun show. You know, it was, it was, it was a lot of interaction between the audience and the band. Right. And at the same time I was working there, I was dealing with, you know, pro bands like Peter Frampton and uh, Mahavishnu Orchestra and all that. And that was all, you know, super pro. These guys were not super pro, but there was some kind of, there was a, a fun thing, right? So I get to know them, right? They had a thing for vintage guitars. I mean, if you look at any of these pictures, they've got all kind of guitars that they would buy from uh, from Larry Friedman up on 48th Street. And um, because they were cool, because they, they looked like the, the guitar, you know, like, uh, like Sylvain, he had a thing for Gretsch guitars because he was a big Eddie Cochran fan. If you don't know who Eddie Cochran is, Google it up, take a look, you know, uh, 50s rock guy, right? Johnny, same thing, you know, if you saw Keith Richard with a double cutaway uh, Les Paul or, or whatever, he's more Les Paul guy. He had a, 
He had a couple of Dan Armstrongs too that were really uh, interesting. I used to own his black one. Uh, he sold it to me for two hundred dollars. Oh wow! Right with a brown strat case. This is nineteen seventy three. Right, you know, and it was like it was not a popular guitar because it was heavy, mm-hmm. and uh, I wish I still had it because now they're like twenty five, three thousand. You know, it was the black one, so it was made out of a different uh, body material, which most people didn't like anyway. The the urban legend was they made a bunch of black ones because they're trying to get Johnny Cash to play them. <laughs> All right, man in black, yeah. but a bin. So. They were also the first band that was popular in New York that I really got to know on a personal level. You know what I mean? They were good, fun people. There was always, you know, something going on. And um, I enjoyed it. It was like a, a, a breath of fresh air to all this hyper technical music that I was also dealing with. Yeah. So, you know, and, and they were, it was like, this is hard to explain. It was like, it was kind of like a uh, a social gang, right? Like nobody, it wasn't like there wasn't a division between band, crew, uh, employees or whatever. Everybody could voice their opinion. In fact, the most of the guys who worked for them could play better than they could and were, would, you know, would say like, you know, they really need to work on that or something. So it was like a, a, a band of equals, you know, uh, and we went everywhere to go. I've got, after I finished, I'd go meet them up at a club and they'd do the hang. Met a lot of people. Boom, boom, boom. So they were like a really entrance door for me. And for all those people who want to know about uh, the drug thing, and uh, it, it wasn't, it's a lot of it that's urban legend too. I mean, they're like, listen, they like to have a good time like anybody, like in the, you know, 20 to 25 bracket you know it's, it's it's that's the way it was but they didn't have no money you have to have money to you know buy drugs or, or to you know get really lit you know what i'm saying so sure. it gets blown out of proportion and but towards the end when they could see failure in their future right that's when harder drugs start to really come in at least from this is from my viewpoint you know i mean things could have been going on in their home life that i don't know anything about but I'm just saying on 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 the the work level and on the show level, it was like you know they were chaotic. They had it. It really it made me enjoy a certain amount of chaos in music. Did you, you know, did the, you ever find that again? Them was, oh yeah. yeah, oh yeah, uh-huh. uh huh. Oh yeah, like, uh, yeah. Actually, for some band, you know, some bands they really try to push the envelope, right? and be entertaining at the same time, you know, and it can get out of, out of control. And I kind of enjoy, I love seeing a train going off the tracks. In fact, the, uh, it's like everybody loves to look at a car accident. You know I mean? Actually the first couple of bands outside of Emerson Lake and Palmer, the first three or four bands I worked for were all like that. So I also come from art school. Right. And, um, I had a, a teacher in art school whose name was Al Hansen. He was kind of my mentor, right? He was a, uh, at one time the leader of the Fluxus movement, was, which was all about chaos and happenings and events, you know, and weird stuff, you know. And he kind of encouraged, you know, letting loose, you know, to let go. At one point, you have to learn, you have to be able to, to let go and just freeform it. You know what I mean? Just yeah. go where the energy is or whatever. And that was really important to me. And that was very, very much uh, part of like the Detroit stuff, like the MC5 and the Stooges. They they had this ability to let go. And to, uh, you know, uh, it was funny because the Stooges used to go, yeah, I love that part of the show when I get to let one go. And that was, you know, they were just go into a free, you know, they're influenced by these freeform jazz guys that were prevalent in the sixties too. It was, um, you know, something, you know, when you start working with bands and you see that they sound exactly the same every day, you know what I mean? That it's, it, it's their show doesn't change, which goes on to this day. If you see multiple nights, any band, you begin to go, it's like, Oh, it isn't like they sat down and they figured out a set list. REM was like that. They were like, they'd give you a set list and there was no guarantees that there was, uh, that that set list would form. When in fact, the lighting designer and I we used to, right after the first song, we just crumple up our set list and throw them away because they were off on a, 
going where they, you know, they felt they needed to go. And it was also with the dolls. It was the first time I was a witness to a band going from a, a local sensation to a global sensation to uh, not being not underestimating the power of the audience to accept how crazy they were. Right. And, and to watch all in a period of two years, you know, uh, watch failure, see what they, they, when, when people begin to realize that it's not going to happen. You know what I mean? To, to, it's like they, they, you tend, when you live in one city, you tend to think that everybody is like the people in that city. And once you actually get out and move around in this country, you begin to realize that sometimes, you know, what you're doing is a little hard for people to assimilate and accept. So, I mean, uh, the dolls, they, you know, I watched this happen to the Stooges. I watched this happen to the New York dolls. And in the long run, I watched that happen to Aerosmith too. In a three year period from May to six, you know, rising to the top and then, you know, starting to come apart. But a thing. But the, I enough? mean, in the case of the Stooges, was there the dream that they were going to be the world's biggest rock band, the who or whomever? Like, I don't think, I don't think people, uh, in, in their case, my, my experience with them, which is not, not long term. Yeah. I did some shows. I did the, like these famous Max, Max's Kansas city shows. I did two nights in Detroit with them in the Michigan palace. Right. They, it's like, they were doing what they do. Right. And then the culture changed. Right. And people started to, you know, they, they weren't selling as many records as the, uh, as the record company would have liked. Right. So there's this famous moment when like the, uh, the guys from, uh, Electra records fly out to their rehearsal space in Ann Arbor, Michigan to hear the new songs. Right. And they don't like them. So they decide that they're not going to, you know, they're not going to do another record. And all of a sudden the wind goes out of your sails, you know, I mean, like they, they, they're, if you look there, there was, that was a time when there were lots of shows, there were lots of festivals. And that band was on plenty of those shows, you know what I mean? They're out there working. They had a very, um, more than the dolls, they had a very Midwestern work ethic, right? Gigs were referred to as jobs. We have jobs this weekend. You should come by, you know, let's go out and play some jobs. And they, and the, all the cost of travel and lodging and all that was way cheaper than it is now. So a band could go out and play for a thousand dollars or 2000 or $3,000 and do a, a show or two a weekend and make money and then drive back to wherever, you know, drive back home or keep going. You know, you have to, you look at the, if you go and find a list of the, uh, the Stooges dates and it's out there, you know, you will see that they worked a lot and the more bands work, the better they get at what they do the more they play out because like the old adage is like, you know, one show is worth 50 rehearsals, mm. right? Because that's, you know, I mean, in, in a rehearsal, there's no audience there and there's no, you know, response at the end of when you do something, you know, and you begin to see what works and what doesn't. I think every band wants to be, be the next Beatles in a way. You know what I mean? Sure. Isn't that the goal? You know, I guess so. I don't know. <laughs> Especially now, I wonder now, I mean, it's like records are, you know, recorded music is in its lowest value in history, mm-hmm. right? And uh, we're in the midst of a thing where there are no live gigs, right? So, I mean, all these bands are streaming and streaming shows, which I am totally against uh, because I think it diminishes uh, the experience. I really do, yeah. you know, because most of them, it doesn't sound good. Right. And it doesn't look big. It's boring. You know, if it's like one camera streaming from your rehearsal spot, you know, and you're not, you know, uh, you can't get up the kind of energy that you get from playing to 100 or 200 or 500 or 1,000 people. It just seems weak to me. And I think it weak. It just makes you look weak to your audience. But that's my opinion. You know, I would much rather see see bands do a podcast where they talk about how they feel about things. Uh, I think that's more interesting. Unless you're a singer songwriter, I've seen singer songwriters do, do, uh, do podcasts that 
um, where they talk, where they play songs and they talk about the songs and they talk about life or, or whatever. And uh, I think it's more interesting. It's more of an insight into uh, somebody's motivation and character than seeing a bunch, uh, than, than seeing a, a rock band. But that's once again, it's my opinion. I've seen too many bands. <laughs> <laughs> You've seen a lot of bands. <laughs> I've seen a lot of bands. I've seen a, a lot of bands do a lot of shows, and uh, you know, you get to be, uh, I guess, uh, I don't know, a critic, uh, or sometimes you have to turn the critical thing off and just, you know, enjoy it for what it is. Yeah. Yeah. So. Well, that's a good segue into uh, a couple questions that were submitted by listeners. Uh, Blair mm-hmm. wanted to know mm-hmm. about. Work, ethic, work ethics and uh, and who, sound checks and who was great at sound checks and who didn't even bother with sound checks. Were there any were there any pivotal bands okay. that uh, you can riff oh, on? Oh yeah. yeah, here here's okay. Well, let's we'll start at uh, we'll start at the top and uh, it's like pro bands, right? Who work and who've been around for a while, right? They have crew people who are really good at what they do. Right. And like in, in a touring, so like when I was, uh, say like, uh, let's use, uh, Aerosmith, right. Uh, as, at one point, everybody knows what their job is and they know what the band needs and they can provide the, the band, you know, they know what they need. And we used to, I, I lobbied really hard to stop them from doing sound checks. Because it's like, like they were a very edgy band, and it's like asking a, a band to come down in the afternoon and play to an empty arena that won't sound like it's going to sound when there's people in it, and then you're asking them to tell you what's wrong, right? <laughs> and, you know what I mean? And so like, tell me what's I can't hear myself. You know, I mean, I can't maybe this that bit bit. Well. The, the running joke was it'll sound better when the people come in. You always say that, you know? So uh, at one point they began to realize that, that they didn't have to come down and they were much happier to come down to a show. They go into their dress room, you know, they put on their crazy clothes, you know, have a cocktail, have a sandwich, whatever, you know, chill. They can hear the crowd and they vibe up, right? You walk out there, they walk out there and no matter, and, and like for the most part, it doesn't matter to them at that point. You know what I mean? Because you play several hundred shows, you, you can tell where you are just by listening to the PA in the room. Right. It depends on the personalities too. Some people are incredibly anal about, you know, they have to be able to, I need to hear the cowbell, you know, it's like fine, you know, but then if you have a crew, they figured that they know that. Right. A good example, uh, more current is that it's like with Ace Frehley, right. Well, let me just say one thing before we move to him. Aerosmith had, had all their own gear. We carried the same, we used the same monitors and the same PA every night for 70 shows, 70, 80 shows, right? So it's, it's an environment that everybody knows how to create. Now, Fraley, we do um, weekends, fly dates, where we fly out, we bring some guitars and some bits, to, you know, and the rest is all rental backline, right? And we t- he tend like Bradley, he tends to, he uses like either nine hundreds or Marshall JCM two thousands, right? Which are readily available everywhere. If I can find them in, in like Whitehorn, Kentucky, <laughs> you know, I can find them anywhere. Right. And he's got uh bradley has got a really good tech who is also the stage manager who knows how to get him the sound that works for him and how to get his monitors, you know, how it works. We usually sound check once on a tour. And that's mainly because we want to run through a song or bring a new song or two songs or whatever. And then the rest of the time, it's, uh, it's like my, uh, the crew band that we have a crew band because, uh, most of the guys who like the drum tech is a very good drummer. The guitar tech is actually a, a really great guitar player, right? Who can, who can put, you know, and the current band are really good players too, you know? So, uh, like, so the crew gets up, they play a couple of songs for me just to check, you know, the environment, in a, in a 2000 feet theater or whatever, make sure the PA is working, make sure, you know, the basics are there that they can hear themselves. You know, Fraley plays really loud, right? So his monitors have to be really loud, right? So a lot in that situation, 
you know, you're dealing with, with people with a lot of experience, right? Smaller bands, when you go into an, a place you haven't played before, it's probably a wise thing to at least, you know, get a feel for what's going on, right? What else is there to do, you know, uh, really? You know, I mean, if you have a bus, if you're traveling by bus, you're hanging in a parking lot of the venue anyway, you know, it depends on what level you are. Maybe there aren't no hotel rooms. Maybe there's like a couple of hotel rooms for sale. That's what the trade-off with the bus is you get like hotel rooms on the day off and maybe a room to shower in after the show, right? And for everything, we travel in a sprinter. Uh, four band members, me, three crew guys. And we have a good time, you know, because the drives are always, a long drive to us is like four hours and that you get to see America. They all love their Starbucks coffee. So you're <laughs> stopping somewhere to coffee them up or some kind of, you know, if you know, some kind of local food thing, like uh, we were in, in the Carolinas and I took them, took a uh, fairly band to this place cookout, which is like a, uh, kind of like a Southern version of in and out burger, right? It's all fresh, cheap, blah, blah, blah. You know, it's like, Experience America. You get out and meet, you know, you know, you, nobody knows who you are. They know who Israeli is, but they don't know who I am. They don't know who, you know, and you just get to get a feel for what's happening around. You know, I've been in every truck stop in America, you know, which is always in, it's like the most interesting thing was taking Donald Fagan into a truck stop. They looked at him like he was E.T., you know, it's like, <laughs> hey, it's five o'clock in the morning, you know, and it's like his truck drivers are all amped up on caffeine and like he's looking for for DVDs to watch, you know, <laughs> it's funny. But, um, so I, that, I mean, that's to say, I don't need personally. I mean, like I like the, I, I prefer the crew band thing. Cause I really think that the, fo the band's focus, unless they're incredibly, you know, been taught from the beginning of time that they have to go there and fritz about and try every guitar and try the new pedal they bought at, at uh, the local guitar shop or someone gave them or something. They just want to, you know, use it not in the heat of battle or something like that. It's fine. I'm there. You know, I mean, if they want to do it, fine. You know, if they don't want to do it, the monitors to me are most important, you know, so they can hear. And I don't deal with that. That's my stage manager deals with that. His name's Rocco. Got it. He's from Staten Island. He's from Staten Island. He's a really big guy. So know? when they really like, when someone hires you, do you have like a whole team of subcontractors that work alongside you or that you well, prefer I, to work I with? Like, yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. In some cases. Yeah. I mean, like if they don't have staff, I can suggest, you know, people yeah. within their budget. You know what I mean? It depends how insane the, the job is. You know what I mean? Like there are people who have insane guitar rigs, right? With all kind of switching and, and, you know, effects racks and pedal boards and all this and that's part of their thing right there you need a competent guy you know because in case of a failure you know i mean you have any kind of computer switching systems the chance of failure is a lot better than a lot, a lot higher than if you're plugging into a pedal board with, with a couple of pedals and um, wire going to your head you know but um yeah, I mean, it's like it's, it's nice to work with people, you know, who are dependable and who can do the job. That's not always not always the case. I've come into to gigs where uh, I've, I, a lot of people I don't know. Yeah. And, um, you know, you just like how is it? Does, how is it? It doesn't really affect my gig that much unless they're totally incompetent and can't get their shit to work by four o'clock in the afternoon, you know. Mm hmm. Going back to the Boom. sound check thing, is there a hack that sound guys know so that when you're sound checking in an empty arena, you can kind of figure out what it possibly will sound like when there's 10,000 people in there? Uh, per personal experience. Yeah. You know what I mean? I mean, a lot of these, a lot of oh, listen, I've been doing this 50 years. Yeah. I've been everywhere you can play a show. <laughs> you know every venue, so, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, well, you know, but there are new smaller venues uh, crop and you know popping up all the time. But a lot of times, you 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 just when you walk in the room, you can by the shape of the room, you can tell it's going to be you know like a a concrete bunker is going to be problematic, right? Round places like the like the old style coliseums indoors can be problematic, right? But also 
the advances in in, uh, in PA systems over the past 30 some odd years have been spectacular. You know, the coverage is much better. You don't people expect a different show than they did in the 70s and the 80s, right? Because like when, once the CD comes on, right, people want bands to sound crisp and clear, you know, and uh, not oppressively loud. You know what I mean? Everybody likes a good, a good slamming show, but I mean, like some shows in the, in the, in the early seventies, it was like a race to see who could be in the Guinness book of records of how loud you could make a show mm-hmm. much to the detriment of the audience. You know, personal experience. Sometimes you can put on, I used to just put on back in black. Right. And, uh, in one song, you can kind of hear what's going on. And like these days, and when we work with all these digital consoles, you can bring up the show from the last night. Right. And blast that through the PA and get a, get an idea. Hmm. You know, I mean, like some of, of where you're at, but there's always, you know, to me, there's always like, you don't know until the band really starts playing. You know, because the running joke is like, yeah, they set their volume for one thing, right? And as soon as they get out there, the uh, in front of people, it's like they run back to the ramps and they turn up, right? And they and as as their ears get pounded, they keep turning more and more up, so there's more volume coming off stage. You don't see that with a lot of the pop country bands, though, because they're all everything is on in ear monitors and everybody's amp is under the stage and the ISO box and uh, you know. Sure. It's all just sort of playing to tracks, all that kind of crap. Have you ever been fired? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I've quit more times than I've been fired. It was funny because this just came up the other day. I got fired in the uh, after, after like the first or second song uh, in a show. What? Right? And um, yeah, it was great. It, it was like, I was like, now I am completely convinced that this band is full of idiots, right? It was on a, a package tour with a lot of these heavy bands, right? Mm-hmm. I'm not even going to bring up the band's name. Okay. But, uh, but, the, uh, but there was a thing about this guy was doing, uh, he wanted to do his own vocal delays on stage, right? Fine, go ahead. But what he was, he was using a little box, uh, a little boss dd3 four pedal okay right and, and like the the cabling to get out to this little box was like a big antenna so there was a lot of noise right so i said let me get you i'll get you a programmable delay and we'll put the you know and uh you'll be able to it'll be sitting on the drum riser and you can tap through these presets and get all your delays right mm-hmm and uh, he had a little, he was a singer and he had uh, a little foot switch uh, by his mic stand to do these presets and stuff like that. Well, he was doing, he was doing pretty good in, in the dressing room, but once you get him in front of 20,000 people, he was having too happy a feet and he kept like, uh, like bypassing, you know, stepping on the wrong button and bypassing the delay. Right. So he, he freaks out. He throws the pedal board into the audience. The audience grabs it, right. Yanks it, the delay comes flying off the drum riser, then ensues a tug of war between the audience and several crew people on stage, right? I'm out in the front going like, oh my God. And I'm actually talking to a, a talk back mic going, cut the cable. Oh my Just God. cut the cable, right? <laughs> right? It's a, it's a $12 switch and some wire. Cut the cable, right? But they were just, they wanted to win. <laughs> a lot of people pulling on that cable, right? So after this whole debacle, you know, the song crashes to an end. He goes, Bob, make sure this show sounds really good because it's your last one. And I was like, wow, okay. I'm wow. good to go, you know. And I turned to the system engineer and a friend of mine who was going to, would be mixing uh, um, uh, uh, Romstein, who came on after us, right? And I go, like, I don't know what to do, you know. I go, like, hey, I've just been fired. Should I walk? And if I was a real dick, I could take the power cable to the con- shut the console down and take the power cable and walk away, and they wouldn't be able to fire that off there. But I said, but that's dropping to a subhuman, unprofessional level. I won't do that, right? So sure. um, what I did was I got on my phone and I started looking for work, right? Mid show. 
Yeah, right in the third song. Okay. I was like, fuck these guys. You know, just like I called a couple of people. I was in Phoenix, right? And um, I called a friend of mine in Tucson, you know, who's a big vintage instrument dealer. And, you know, he's in the know. This is 1998. And I go, hey, I'm, you know, I just got fired. And he goes like, hey, come on over. You want to engineer some stuff? And I go, what do you mean? You know, uh, he goes, I've got a, a, an artist in here and a British producer. And like, I could use another engineer. So I'm like, great. Right. So next call was, uh, uh, it was Emmy Lou Harris. Right. And the producer was, um, uh, what's it called? Uh, that'll come to me eventually. It's in the field. Uh, so the next call was to enterprise cause they'll come pick you up. Right. So I said, I need a car. Right. So at the end of the show, the, you know, uh, I just, uh, I just, Everybody, as I went backstage, everybody's going, don't go in the dressing room. Don't go in the dressing room. Don't go in the dressing room. I'm like, I'm not going to the dressing room. I got fired. I'm going to the bus. I'm getting my stuff. My rent a car is here and I'm gone. Right. So I got in and, and drove two hours to Tucson. Right. And uh, checked into a lovely hotel there and uh, was ready to get going. So the next day, all hell breaks, breaks loose. Where are you? I'm like, I'm in Tucson. Why are you there? Like, I got fired last night. He goes, why aren't you on the bus? And I go, because I got fired, you know? And I go like, I got fired. So I'm gone. I got another gig. Right. And all kind of havoc uh, went on at that point. And the man, you know, the singer had said to me at one, at one point, he goes, listen, I know a monkey could mix this band. Right. So the manager gets on the phone, you know, and, and says to me, he goes, you got to come back. The next show is L.A. It's a big deal. And I go, well, you know, the, the, the LV lead vocal, right? He said a monkey, you know, could mix this show. So I'm sure there's plenty of monkeys in L.A. who would love to do this. A lot of calls back and forth. I mean, like, come back. I got, I got a better gig. They go, we'll double your salary. I go, I'm not coming back. They said, we'll triple your salary. I went. Okay, right. So I got back in the car, drove back to Phoenix, dropped the car, went to the bus, got on the bus, right? Because we're a separate bus from crew had a separate bus in the band, right? So, so then in L.A. it was like uh, me versus the lead singer, and he he tried to apologize, and I would not accept it. The postscript on this is that I had a show tape of this. And I used to have it on my answering machine. So if you called and says like I'm not able to take it, you know, it would go like. They would say, Bob, make this show sound really good because it's your last show. And then I'd say, please leave a message. <laughs> Fantastic. That was on there for a while. It was kind of fun, yeah. Have you been, have, have there been other shows where you were fired mid-show? No. I, no, okay. No, That's no, no. Idea. I've gotten fired at the end of tours, right, uh, for a variety of things. Usually for not paying attention. Uh, a lot of times it, uh, uh, Oh, this is a good one. This is, a, this is also a band psychology thing, right? When I go to work for, for bands, one of the things you really want to find out is who makes the decisions, right? And a lot of times, um, you know, I was working with a really young band, and I go, how do you guys make your decisions? They go, we're a democracy. Everybody has an equal vote. I went, oh. And they go, what do you mean? And I go, the problem, what I found in bands with democracy is the bands are made up of usually – you know, uh, a variety of people, right? And usually it's like a couple of smart guys, uh, a couple of uh, guys who think they're smart, and usually the young guy who doesn't comprehend what's going on, and he becomes the swing boat. So if, he, if the, if the not-so-smart guys can convince the swing boat guy, they can, you know, guide your career, right? So... I, doing this band, I once told them when I came in to work with them that I will do something for you that no band, no band ever gets. I said, I will tell you the complete truth about what's happening to you, right? So they would, you know, things would come up. They go like, you know, in our contract, it says we do four videos. I go, that's really great. I'm really glad to hear that. I said, the only problem is getting them to do that. They go, but it's in the contract. And I go, you know how much lawyers cost? I go, and you're gonna, you're a new band and you're gonna take on a big company like B BMG, right? Do you know what BMG means? They go, 
no. I go, big, mean Germans, <laughs> right? I go, they will, they will snuff your career in an instant, right? So I would tell, you know, oh, this and that, you know, and I go, and to tell you the truth, you guys can barely pay for your cell phones and most of you live at home, right? So this kind of battle is not going to work, right? So in the course of a year, right, when they began, once again, when they began to see that shiny light that says failure coming up, right, they were, you know, because at one point I go like, like, yeah, well, you know, we're going we're gonna to work this. And I go, you watch. At one point, someone will look at how many records you sold versus how much money it cost, right? And what there was, the next, the next sound you will hear is it's time to do a new record. I go, that's the kiss of death. That's when they pull the money. Right? So at one point, these guys got fed up, right? And they, they, uh, they um, took a vote and decided I had to go, right? You had to go. <laughs> so okay. they went, yeah, you've got to go. You're raining in our parade, buddy. You know, we can't take all this reality anymore. So I was like, oh, I'll stop, right? So they were mad, though. Several of them were really mad. They went to see the vice president of A&R at, uh, at BMG. Right. And they, they sit down in front of him and they go, you know, we said we got down, we sat down and we have this issue with Bob and we sat down and, and had a boat. And he goes, oh, you sat down, and had a boat, how democratic. And, I, and he goes, and he goes, what do you vote on? And he goes, Get rid of Bob. So where'd you vote? Bob's got to go. And he goes, well, that's democracy in action. But unfortunately, every action has a reaction. Here's the deal. Bob goes. So does your tour support. So swallow that, pals. The door's over there. Right. So then they hated me even more. Right. So it was like, it was an uncomfortable situation. Um, and uh, so I left. You know, uh, I mean, I was like, oh, I'm not taking this shit from a bunch of kids. You know, so I went and uh, it was actually a very soft departure. I went and I got someone to take my place. And I said, in the, you know, in honesty, I've been offered this tour of Japan. And in three weeks, I will make more money than I do with you in two months. So I'm doing it, right? This is so-and-so. He's a great guy. You know, uh, he's a very good engineer. And he will take care of you while you're opening for three doors down, you know, or whatever. And, uh, and I left. And uh, the ones I've been fired by managers for a variety of reasons, you know. Uh, um, a lot of it having to do with money. Sure. You know, uh, uh, and uh, yeah, so, but you get used to it. You know, you're used to, um, you get, you know, if I used to be uh, in bands, right? You get used to rejection, right? It doesn't bother me. Sometimes it, it's like, it's their choice, their money. If I got to go, I got to go. I don't care. Do you uh, know, are, are you I've at been, the high end of the pay grade for what you do? Oh yeah. You are? Yeah. The highest? Yeah, I am. Yeah. Uh, they're probably, well, I don't know about nowadays, but I use, I, I was making a lot of money at one point. Uh, and uh, probably the best money I made was Steely Dan. I wasn't even mixing Steely Dan. Yeah. I was like the highest paid entertainment director in the music business. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> we we talked about uh, to, to shift gears from the negative where we were, you know, you, you right. talked about your uh, at length. We talked about your relationship with Walter Becker, which sounds amazing. What other artists mm-hmm. did you really have that simpatico thing with where you were talking about old guitars and music and you felt like real friends? Uh, Joe Perry, Brad Whitford, mm-hmm. from Aerosmith. Um, I'm trying to think, uh, you know, I've, I've, like, there's bands I've worked for, for a lot of, for a long time, you know, and sometimes you just, you know, uh, it's a business you, you kind of have to, you don't want to be somebody, you know, you, you have to have a little bit, you have to have distance, right? Because your friendship can then, um, affect your, uh, your job thing. You know, I mean, I mean, I talked to, I have, you know, I had uh, never worked for Eddie Van Halen, but I had met him really early on, right? And mm-hmm. then did the same band that was trying to get rid of me was opening for Van Halen in 04, right? And uh, um, my significant other had uh, had gotten cancer, right? And Ed found out and he came over to me and he said, listen, you know, and just like, I've been through cancer. Let me be there for you, right? Let me help wow. you. You know, he goes, I have a whole cancer clinic have her slides go to, uh, to them and get a second opinion. And I was like, ah, and he went, it's on me. 
right? I'm like, okay, right? So, Amazing. and then uh, he, he said, at one point he said to me, he goes like, hey, you know, I got a lot of time during the day. You want some guitar lessons? Because he knew I could play, right? And, uh, and I was, you know, when it was possible, because I was the tour manager, production manager, front of house guy. Gets in some, and when you're on a Van Halen tour, you're really busy. But I always tried to visit with him for a, a little bit. And it was like, you know, I knew I wasn't going to be able to play like him ever because I don't want it. That's not how I wanted to play. But it was like, uh, it was a great opportunity, right? So the first time I went in the tuning room, uh, he says, he goes, ask me a question. I go, how do you hold your pick? And he goes, you may be the most insightful person to ever ask me a question about guitar. That's when I found out that he used a thin pick and the picks that that, that he throw, that get thrown into the audience are heavy picks and not the actual pick that he uses. Right? And uh, I asked him a question like, uh, show me how far you can stretch. And when I saw how far he could stretch his fingers, I was like, I will never be able to do that because I don't want to do that. Cause you go, you just got to keep stretching, Bob. You know, it's kind of fun. I'm, you know, and I had his cell phone number for a long time, you know, and every once in a while I call and check in, you know, and uh, how are you, you know, because I felt that I owed him a, uh, um, for the offer because it came at, at a stressful time in my life and it was uh, a very nice offer and uh, I also had that relationship with, with with other players too you know James Williamson from the Stooges right mm-hmm. uh, Sylvain and, and David Johansson I'm talking to them you know uh, you know they, there's a lot of musicians uh, around uh, New York that I have long relationships with you know and you try to be friendly, you know, I mean, it, it depends on where they are in your career. You know, the Becker thing, though, was was much more a intense, everyday kind of thing, because we worked on projects sometimes, they would be like, every day for 22 days in a row. Right. And uh, so you get to know a lot about people, I got to know a lot about, um, you know, you know, sometimes he would talk about making records. And why they did this and why they did that and blah 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 mm-hmm. i'm sure i'm shorting people you know that's <laughs> fine that would mean like, uh, phone call number three imagine me yeah here's, here's another one uh is that I, pro- um, I have really good relationships with with all the bill with with all the builders and amp guys and stuff like that you know um the, who i can you know they're very valuable to me and they were all really good people and they're all really you know um I support American craftsmanship, you know, from, uh, you know, George at Metropolis who builds like the best Marshall style amps I ever played through to Ian Anderson, who makes some nice guitars, Chio Han, you know, Adam Grimm at Satellite, you know, and you learn from these people, you know, little bits, little, little gems of info, you know, like, uh, you know, it's like the most important tube is the first 12 AX7 in your amp change that first because that's where the whole you know your touch feel tone thing really that's the foundation so i used to watch van halen van halen would change his uh 12ax7 like in between songs well he didn't but i mean his his crew guy did you know he was he was like oh this is he goes i have a whole case for 12ax7 you know and you're like go get me another one you won't stock. And he had a big asbestos glove. And he'd reach into the back of the number one head, put it on standby, pull the, the first tube out, put another one in, fire it up. He goes, this is very stressful. I'm like, I bet. <laughs> <laughs> who, who had the best ears of all the guys you got to work with in terms of being able to oh, hear Becker. the minutia of that stuff? Becker. Becker, without a doubt. You know, I mean, there's other guys who, uh, who are very sharp, but it depends on <laughs> how much, how, how loud they played over a period of time. You know, sometimes, you know, it takes a toll, you know, I tell everybody that it's like, you've got to take care of your ears. You know, I never really use headphones unless I'm on an airplane, uh, or I have to, you know what I mean? Uh, and, uh, I want to listen to some music, uh, I don't use headphones when I'm mixing shows. I use near field monitors and if I'm on a fly date, uh, you know, it's like I make somebody, I make the system engineer listen, find the buzz. Yeah. But Becker, he was, he was really, 
Well, the guys, they know what they want. You know, it comes down to what they're looking for. If they can define what they're looking for and achieve that, they usually become happy guys. You know, it's like, then it becomes more about, uh, you know, not about the amplifier thing, but more about uh, the relationship with instruments. I mean, there are guys who change guitars in every song, and there's guys who play the same, who've been playing the same guitar for 20 years. You know, it's a, that what works for them. Uh, comfy old print. You you famously were Walter Becker's guitar pimp. Were there other big yeah. players who you turned on to boutique guitars or just specialty yeah. guitars? Yeah, I'm personally responsible for the rise of BC Woods. <laughs> All right, let's hear it. Well, what it was is that um, uh, I moved to, after my first Aerosmith tour. I had enough. I didn't. I was. I decided I was never going back. I didn't want to be in that situation. I moved to LA because I wanted a fresh start, mm -hmm. right? And uh, I was sharing an apartment with Rob Lawrence. Do you know who Rob Lawrence is? Yes. How did that come about? Yeah. Oh, actually, I was at, at California Jam, my last show ever with Emerson, Mike, and Palmer. I met him backstage. He had pictures of, of old guitars, right? And I uh, thought so he was an interesting guy, right? And um, he, he was an a, interesting a guy. Side, right? Yeah. He's a very interesting guy. And I, I shared an apartment with him for, uh, for like three, four months, right? Learned a lot. Learned a lot, right? And, um, uh, here's, a, here's a Rob Lawrence moment, right? And uh, we were in San Diego, 1975, right? End of an Aerosmith tour. Things were really starting to pop. They had some money, right? And I knew, I've been wheeling and dealing guitars since like the late 60s, right? So I knew a lot of guys. There weren't no stores. You know, you knew guys who had stuff, right? So I call Rob and I go, hey, listen, the band's looking to buy some stuff, you guys. And cool, he goes out, well, I have a nice gold top, a 58 gold top. And a uh, you know a three pickup uh, Firebird Seven, right? And I was like, cool, bring them down, right? So he brings them down, and it was funny. The band was like checking them out and, and and into it, right? And it was like, how much? And it was just you'll love this. The gold top is eight hundred and fifty dollars, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. The Firebird Seven is a thousand dollars, and and the band goes and and like Brad goes like, why is the Firebird Seven? more expensive than the, than the Les Paul. He goes, oh, they only made 60 of those, you know, or whatever the number was. And they made, you know, several hundred of these gold tops. It's a much rarer guitar. Needless to say, they bought both of them, right? And, uh, you know, so I always knew a lot about gear. I was, you know, uh, I, I, I met some uh, early guitar builders, uh, spent time at, like uh, at Guitar Lab and, uh, out of Pastore music where they had this Luthier cat named uh, Ronaldo, right? And you learn things and you, when you wheel and deal guitars, you learn about where they are. It's not like it is today where you're, you know, there was no internet. You knew somebody, right? So I would recommend, I would recommend things. They get back to the BC Ritz thing. So I'm living in LA. Rob says, we should go to a NAMM show. Let's go to the NAMM show in, uh, uh, in January in Anaheim. I'd never been to one. I've been to AES shows where they show all kind of audio gear. And I was like, okay, sounds like fun. That time, at that time, I believe the NAMM show was one, maybe two days. And it was in the ballroom of the Disneyland hotel. That's how small it was. Right. And at that show, I saw BC Rich guitars. I saw seagulls and I saw a, a prototype mockingbird. Right, that wasn't really on display because they were they were showing it to people uh, off the show floor because they were getting ready to leave the distributor that they had to deal with. Right, so I saw this guitar and I was like, wow, this is like the best. It's like a next. It's like a Firebird, but it's even cooler. Right, so I go, I get, uh, I wind, you know. So I said, I'm gonna. I said, that's real. It was like an SG meets a Firebird. Meet, you know, it's Gibson, but it's neck through, and it's got, you know. It's really cool looking it looks like a spaceship you know it's really it doesn't look traditional so i eventually get a job offer like in march from aerosmith to come back right and uh, i cut myself a really good deal to come back right so uh it's time to leave la 
and go back to, to New York and get ready to, to do this thing. Because they said part of my deal was they paid me 52 weeks a year, whether we, whether they worked or not nice. retainer deal, yeah. right? It was a very good deal right, for me. But as like uh, Steven Tyler says, you know, if we're paying you, we need you in the studio. Right. And so I had to go to record plant for all the, uh, the overdubs and, uh, and some tracking for, um, for the rocks album. Right. I was ma- I had some, I was making some dough, right? Still living at home, mm-hmm. right? Couch surfing kind of thing, right? I go to Pastori, and Pastori has that guitar, the Mockingbird, mm-hmm. right? So on April fifteenth, I bought that guitar. What do I do? First thing I do is put it in the trunk of the car, take it over to the record plant, show it to Joe Perry, right? Joe Perry flips out. He loves this thing, right? He starts playing. He doesn't. I don't think he used it on the record. I don't remember. I doubt it very much. I uh, and uh, but. He's asked me, he goes, can you bring that on tour and can I play it during the show? I was like, of course you can. Right? So that was a big breaker for them because all of a sudden, I mean, like I think, you know, uh, they had gone into the 20,000 and up thing. I did a show with them that was like 50,000 people indoors. A lot of people saw that guitar. If you talk to any of the BC rich guys, you can say that they went from, you know, when Joe Perry started playing that, that guitar, it, inc- it was incredible exposure for them. And they went from selling like, uh, you know, 20 guitars a month and, to selling, you know, 40 guitars a week, you know, so it really ramped up the thing for them. He was a high profile guy. It began to uh, show me the, uh, you know, uh, the power, you know, of, uh, of somebody playing, you know, an instrument in a popular band. Because at one point, everybody had the same thing. It was a Strat, a Telecaster, or a Les Paul. If you were really kind of edgy, you had a Firebird or something else, you know. It was really, you know, Fenders and Gibson kind of thing. And this mm-hmm. was like a whole new thing. And to me, it was like, a, you know, it was a guitar made by how I watched people make them and cut, the, you know, cut the wood in uh, in the wood shop and stuff. And it was very, I was very impressed with this, so. That that launched, you know, did a good, uh, did good, good exposure for them. Sure. Because back then, how do you? All you had was Guitar Player magazine in 1976. Yeah. You know what I mean? And, and to uh, get an ad in that, we, you know, that was like the tour had been over by the time an ad, you know, came out sure. in that. Well, so you know, you know, you you wind up dealing with all these people, and I could get, you know so-and-so a guitar someone say i need brad wanted a guitar but he doesn't want one a pointy one like joe he wants something a little more traditional so i got him an eagle you know blah 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 and then i try and do that with uh you know i help try and help guys you know achieve the sound they desire in some ways you know i mean like if you want a 58 flying v i know where they are you know you get better get rid of them they went that pricey to be honest you know i remember buying up a, a burst for 350 bucks where was that? That was at uh, a street corner in New York. Of course. <laughs> Where you buy your birds? Yeah, well, well, I was I was in the guitar store. I was in the guitar store, and this guy came in to sell it. Sell it. He wanted three hundred and fifty dollars, and I was on my way to Dan Armstrong to uh, to buy a Dan Electro guitar, and I had three hundred bucks in my pocket, three hundred fifty bucks in my pocket, right? And I'm in this store looking uh, at some stuff. He shows, he goes, I want 350 And they go, we'll offer you 100 right? The guy walks out, right? And the, the guy behind the counter goes to the other one. He goes, you know, I've heard they're paying 850 for those up in Woodstock. Mm-hmm. So I just, like, I spun around, went out the door, and the guy was standing out there. And he goes, I'll give you 350 for that. Paid him the 350 Boom. Bob's first burst. Nice. I don't have it anymore. It's long gone. Say, how long did you hold on to it? A while. A while. They were cheap back then, you know. I mean, you could. You, I remember, you know, gold tops, two hundred and fifty bucks. This, you know, this is a long time ago. Yeah, when they were when they were just used guitars. We've you've talked about a lot of the new luthier, newer contemporary luthiers. We talked about Guitar Lab. We talked about Dan Armstrong. You've been around long enough that you met. You've probably met some luthiers who were brilliant, but because they predated Instagram and all these guitar magazines fell by the wayside. Do any stand out? Woody Pfeiffer. Mm-hmm. Who's still around. I've interviewed him. Yeah. He's still around. Yeah. Still around. You know, he was, 
in in the New York, you know, people in the know guitar wise, he was the best fret guy on the planet Earth. Mm -hmm. If you had a woody, I mean, having a Pfeiffer fret job, refret on any guitar was like a, a plus. You know, uh, I had my Les Paul custom, uh, you know, ref, you know, I had those frets, those stupid frets pulled out. Uh, they go, who did it? And it was like Woody Pfeiffer. And they go, oh, <laughs> he had that thing. You know, there was, uh, he did a great job. You know, it was funny because it's funny bring, uh, I'm bringing up fret jobs because just talking to somebody, I go, what's the price of a fret job nowadays? And they said $500 for a fret job, mm -hmm. right? And I was like, I'd sell the guitar and buy another one. <laughs> so I think of other, uh, I'm serious. That's why I play ball fine neck guitars. Um, and why I have a lot of guitars because then your frets don't wear down. There you go. You, know, you don't play it, you know. You're, you're, right, yep, absolutely. I'm trying to think of other builders. Um, there was a really nut, uh, uh, let's not say nutty. I uh, already oh, said it. Too bad for me. A guy named Joel Cawthorn, huh. right, who I met in college, right? He made a solid body guitar with a granite body, a thin, you know, like, like maybe a half inch, three quarter inch thick. And this thing, it was, it was like spinal taps. You could hit a note, go have lunch and come back and that note was still ringing. You know, uh, he made a really, really beautiful guitar. You can't discount uh, Carl Thompson, right? Um, who predominantly made basses, but did make some guitars, right? There, uh, Ken Parker made some crazy solid bodies, right? Uh, before he became Ken Parker, right? He used to do repair at, at a vintage place. That, uh, at uh, I worked for We Buy Guitars, the smaller store, not the big store, and he was the head of repair. And he was he. I learned a lot from him. I really did. Real, you know, about wood and about uh, like frets. And, and all this kind of shit. He was the first guy to install Floyd Rose in New York City. Hmm. So, you know, I'm trying to think of other uh, other fab builders. It was, you know, guys uh, like out at Alembic and guys out at Stars Guitars who were, who were very cutting edge, you know. Who, uh, and, you know, it was all, it was very local. You know, they built guitars for the love of the instrument. And, it, you know, because it, it's hard to support yourself as a small builder, mm -hmm. right? And a lot of times you either go into repair and say, you know what, I'm just gonna, you know, bread and butter, I can do bread and butter fret jobs and, and, and setups and, and, and repairs all day long without, you know, without any drama. And, um, you know, building instruments when everybody wants a Les Paul or a Strat, you know, I mean, it goes on to this day. I mean, look at it, look at, look at how a lot of guys start out. They make clones of, of, of guitars, you know I mean? like. How many people start, you know, because guitar players are notoriously traditional, right? You know, so like, what do you add to the party? You know, if you make it too, you know, uh, far out, people won't buy into it. There's plenty of guys like that who made interesting instruments that really didn't fly because they were too, you know, outrageous or too, uh, you know, too futuristic for people. I'm trying to think of any, any other guys. Uh, Ronaldo over in Jersey, he's still building. He's got to be like 80 years old, you know, and he still builds, you know, and his he has a very interesting design, like Italian design aesthetic, you know, like a, it's like if you're familiar with the, you know, the Davoli Wandre guitars, mm -hmm. that's, that's kind of a, you know, the... Uh, Italian accordion aesthetic applied to guitars, and he made some some interesting things, you know. Uh, but it's 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 hard. People fall by the wayside, not as as much as amp guys. Amp guys really are. They, that's the biggest struggle. Yeah. To stay up, to stay in business. Yeah, for sure. What uh, as somebody who is a tasteful guitar person who has seen artists large and small on stages large and small, what's been the most irritating guitar gimmick, guitar trend <laughs> that has bugged you whenever you see anyone open a case with it? Uh, I don't know. Uh, it's like, um, you have to think that one through. Paul Reed Smith. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Coming on strong. Okay. <sighs> Uh, well, you know fan. what? Let's have, let's have a little controversy here. Okay. You know, I met Paul Reed Smith when he was like a repair guy. 
in the Baltimore, D.C. area, right? And uh, then, because uh, it'd be if you had, like, I got to say that in, in, in like, the 70s, the, the guitar techs were basically guys who could lift and could maybe tune a guitar. They weren't repair people, right? Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, they could maybe fix something in the heat of battle, right? So occasionally there'd be, you know, and we the, the knowledge was not as prevalent as it is now. No one knew what a grind and polish was. No one knew that you could, you know, you uh, you could, you know, do things. You you would just get the local repair guy. I had uh, like in the D.C. area, I remember sending Aerosmith guitars that had uh, neck breaks to Danny Gatton, who yeah. did repairs, right? Yeah. And then Paul Reed Smith. You know, I mean, it's like. Um, I've owned in my career one Paul Reed Smith guitar, right? And it's like, it just, it doesn't appeal to me, right? Uh, because it just doesn't appeal to me. Mm-hmm. Right? I think, I think his whole, when he started really pushing that, like, you know, uh, you know what does he call that? You know, his special woods and stuff like that, sure. you know, a premium you know, premium choice, whatever, you know, it's, it's, it, it just turned into a marketing thing. You know, I, I've been, it, to me, it's like, if you want to play good, you know, I didn't like them cause they had, uh, they had like a strat vibratos on them. I would have much prefer. I said, listen, if you're going to copy a Les Paul jr. And make it balance better, why don't you put a wraparound tail piece on it? It took him like a long time to actually do that, you know, and the switching system was irritating to me. You know, so like, you know, rotary switch really try doing that really fast, you know, when you're playing, when you're the only guitar player in a song or whatever. Uh, it's, uh, you know, it, it was the marketing really annoyed me. You know, I mean, a nice enough guy, don't get me wrong, you know, I, I just, the, the guitar doesn't appeal to me. I, you know, do you get into you it with a lot of luthiers? Uh, no, not really. Um, you know, uh, I just don't, you know, I, I, I don't have the, con- I don't have the energy or the desire to, to do confrontations anymore. I, you know, if I go to a NAMM show, I just don't go to that booth. You know, I mean, if I think that if I can help them, I try and help them and give them some kind of heat of, you know, like how things are actually functioning in the real world. You know what I mean? Cause a lot of those guys, they, they're busy building stuff. And it's, you know, rare for them, you know, very rare in a long time to get actual feedback from the end user. You know, it's like, eh, you know, this and that, I don't know, you know, boom, boom, boom. I think they just, you know, I, I think they became uncool because of the way they had their endorsement program, right? That they would jump on whoever, whatever was hot, you know, when they started like, uh, you know, uh, you know, going after uh, bands in the, uh, who are doing that, that kind of like, uh, you know, hip hop ish metal thing. You know, I was like, I don't know. You know, and then it gets a reputation as like a, you know, for, for doctors and lawyers to sit in their office and they can say, that's Babinga. And that's a Paul Ferro fingerboard. You know, I'm more, you know, I guess I just I got a chip about on his shoulder. I mean, I, I, I was working for Ted Nugent. He started playing a Paul Reed Smith guitar. It's like, please go back to the bird land. It's not a whammy bar. And I was like, oh, good. So, but, um, you know, some guys say, you know, some guys think they're the be all and end all. And, you you know, when you do this long enough, you realize you can't stop learning. You always have to, you know, keep up with what's going on, you know. And, like, I've had arguments about stainless steel frets, you know, Um is that you know is it worth the effort i don't know not to me i'm not just talking about prs uh, we can put that to bed but uh you've probably seen a lot of musicians who got an endorsement deal and got a uh inferior guitar from what they were playing before but their pride got in the way right well a lot of times people you know it, there, there's a you know did we, I don't know if we addressed this uh, in the last one. Here's the thing, right? When when you're trying to to stand out, uh, you know, all of a sudden, personal, you know, like if someone offers you, I will give you a full color, full page color, you know, uh, and and this guitar for free, a full page ad in Guitar Holder magazine, 
right? And in return, you know, you have to play this guitar for at least a couple of songs, right? And the guitar is yours, you know, and, and people will, will buy into that. And the funny thing is that the people who need the free guitars are really kind of like, you know, early entry level guitar players, guys who are really popular, you know, it, it, it's like they can afford to buy them. Well, that's what I loved about Becker. Becker wouldn't take anything for free. He would rather pay for it and pay full price because he could. And he felt like he was helping people get along. Right. So there are plenty of guys who'll take something, they pose for an ad, you know, they play it for, for a tour and the next thing you know, it's, it's, you know, it's in, it's in a lockup or it's in, you know, uh, they sell it off, you know, and uh, I've seen times when people are endorsing two different guitars in the same magazine, mm-hmm. you know, and then what is, what does that to say to your credibility? You know, you, you spend, you know, say 20 years building up your credibility as a musician, right. And then you're playing, you know, uh, you know, so, you know, a guitar basically just to be in a magazine. You know, I mean, like, uh, I don't know, you know, it's a, it's a, that's, I think that's probably a source of great annoyance to me, Got it. you know, but that's my own personal opinion and it doesn't really, uh, reflect the real world. Mm-hmm. Ask me another one. All right. Well, Kyle, one of our listeners wanted to hear stories about little habits or work methods that artists use to get shit done, stay sane, et cetera, that nobody else really saw. Get out of the hotel. <laughs> I'm serious. There are people who spend their entire, you know, spend like the travel day or an off day. They sit in a, they sit in a hotel and they watch, you know, uh, you know, and both, you know, watch Netflix uh, constantly. You know, it's like get out. I had a thing going where every time I was, uh, you know, in a city, I would try to go to a museum there, right, just to get out and and you know get away from the people I've been spending time in a submarine with, you know, and go and absorb a little culture, right? For a while, it was art museums, right, and then. Uh, uh, car museums were really kind of cool, right? Um, Air Force, you know, uh, you know, plane museums. There's plenty of those around. We can go look at all these, you know, World War II aircraft and space shuttle stuff. You know, they just get out of the house and 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 like don't sit there pondering the, you know, that your career is about to crash or whatever. You know, that absorb some culture. Be, you know, and uh, get out and see people. Eat a nice a nice meal. You know, it's just some people burrow in and, and and don't, you know, I see that a lot when people go to Europe or Japan. They're just a friend. I don't speak the language because don't want, it doesn't matter. Somebody always speaks English nearby, no matter where you go, you know, and you get out and, and, and see what's going on. Because a lot of people's uh, viewpoint of, let's just use America, viewpoint of America is filtered by, by what you what they've seen on TV, you know, and once you get out and, and see real life, you begin to realize um, that we are way more alike than we are different from each other, you know, and you won't experience that. if all you see is like hotel gig, hotel, airport gig, hotel, you know, get out and, and see, you know, I did this thing where I, I wanted to go to every old train station in America. Okay. Right. And you, and with, um, because the architecture is spectacular, they don't build train stations like that anymore. And when you can, you know, you, you make friends in all these cities, you got someone with a car who will come get you and will show you, you know, like, I want to go to Union Station in, uh, in Cincinnati. You go there, you take a look, it takes an hour out of your day, you know, and then you go and someone says, you have to try Skyline Chili. So you go and eat Skyline Chili and you go, oh, I don't think I'll ever do that again. But I, now I know what it is, you know, and, uh, and live life, man. You can't, you can't like, you know, visit guitar stores, record stores when they used to exist. That was a lot of fun. You know, I used to go in and say, who's the cool local band? They have a seven inch, you know, is there something, you know, because record stores used to hip you to things, you know, about the internet now has ruined all that. You know, it's like, a, it's hard to have a brick and mortar guitar store. Right. It's hard to have you, record stores or it's like insane. You know, I mean, like uh, and everybody online has an opinion and everybody, you know, you'll hear there's a lot of misinformation, right? which is uh, another another problem. 
these days. That you know, it's, I read on I, that young band they used to go, well, I read on the internet. And I was like, there's a lot of false information on the internet, you know. And like some guys, you know, some bands that it's the same thing. You want to go? To, I mean, I I remember um, one tour. It was like we're interesting of going to a zoo. Right, because it was a break. Right, we go see some some zoo, like the St. Louis Zoo, you know, or some San Diego Zoo. And there's a, you know, I mean, go to the art museum in uh, in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, you know, or go to a, uh, you know, find some kind of local local place that uh, that had a good burger or something, just to break the monotony of like room service or or chain hotels. Most of my most of my tours, we we avoid chain chain restaurants and we want to you know do a local restaurant owned by you know somebody who lives in that town and not some kind of uh you know burger king you know or steak and shake or something like that you'd rather go and get a uh a nice meal from somebody who actually cares you know and sanity i, I think it helps I, I really do you know go to canada and, and enjoy you know Poutine and smoked meat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I've noticed on your uh, social media feed, you've you've shared a few videos with that barstool sports guy who does the pizza I by the slicer. I think he's reviews. really cool. But but, yeah. well, but if uh, if I shout out a city, can you tell me where you'd be eating to, if you were there, transported uh, that, there? Well, uh, well, let's, let's 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 give it a try. All right. You know, sometimes I need. I listen. I will say as a caveat in the beginning, a lot of times I'll have to research it. Okay. Or, or go like, where did we where did we go in San Francisco? All right. Uh, or what was the name of that place? I'll just go start with uh, Seattle. Well, I'll, yeah, let's do Seattle. Public Market. Mm-hmm. Where, there's a breakfast place there that we go to. You know, I mean, it's like with, with Steely Dan, we always stay at the Four Seasons, right? You just walk up the hill and you're there, right? Mm-hmm. I love seafood, right? Can't get any better than that, right? I can't remember the name of the place we used to go to eat breakfast. You know, uh, but it was is, like there's a every bunch, time, but yeah, what, yeah, but I mean, it was good, you know, I mean, it was uh, it was fun. I, uh, you know, you look out over the bay and it's it, it beats, you know, any kind of, of chain or hotel restaurant. Mm-hmm. Buy Bo- another one, Boise, Boise, Idaho. I'd have to research that, <laughs> I'd have to, I'd have to, I, I, must, I. I can't remember the last time I was in Boise, Idaho. Right. I do remember going to a pretty cool guitar store there, though. I can't remember the name. I have to look it up. Uh, Denver. I have databases. Of you do? Denver. Oof. Yeah, I do. Um, Denver. I'm mm, working. I'm working my way east. That's okay. I would, uh, I'll tell. Well, wait, wait, let's, let's do something more oblique than Denver. Denver's all got a lot of good food. Um, uh, Bob Reinhardt, who uh, had Reinhardt amps for a while, yeah. and now uh, builds uh, uh, drag ra- high high speed drag racing engines in Denver. Okay. Right, I just I'll go to him. I'll just call Bob and say like, where should we go? And he'll take me somewhere. Okay. You know, to, to usually off the path. but like uh, Salt Lake City, the red iguana, best Mexican food I ever had. Mm-hmm. I've heard that from others. In Salt Lake City, Utah. Yeah, yeah, it's a good place. Kansas like, City. Keep going. Uh, how can you not have barbecue in Kansas City? Mm-hmm. Right? It's like I'm not a rib guy, you know. Uh, so the uh, and the uh, I'll always, you know, there's plenty of places to go. They're all famous. You go and you check it out, you know. It's uh, and like uh, it's part of the experience, you know. I don't have a real favorite in KC. Okay. I'm really failing on this. No, no, it's fascinating. <laughs> Keep going. Want to see that Try spreadsheet? Another. Um, Philly. Oh, uh, uh, you're going to love this one. John's roast pork. Okay. It's a best roast pork sandwich ever. And they do a good cheesesteak. You're in Philadelphia. You might as well have a cheesesteak. There's a couple of good pizza places there. You can eat. Listen, if you like Italian food and you're in South Philly, you can't go wrong. Mm Mm-hmm. You know, you go find a mom and pop place that's been in, in business for a long time. You know, they take it they they take it seriously there. That's another thing about once you get out of the big cities and get out of the hotels, you know. People do take pride in what they do, especially people who cook. You know, especially in the last fifteen, twenty years when when uh being a good chef and the food network has made you know, 
you you are looked at these these people as they're you know they take pride in their work just like a good a good builder or or a good repairman you know you go to a good food place do you have uh oh, let me throw out one more that's uh not known for its regional cuisine orlando mm. interesting orlando <laughs> uh <laughs> That's funny. I just I didn't hardly ever go there either. Uh no, actually I was there like a year ago with Fraley playing the hard rock there. And I think that uh hard rock casino or whatever it is, and uh I can't really think of uh any really spectacular I did go to a place that had alligator uh sushi. Oh. Which I thought was really bizarre. Yeah. Right. In in a in a Japanese restaurant that a that a, a, a long time friend who had a car took me to. You have to try the alligator. Was it raw? I go, I'm not going to die. Yeah. Wow. Oh. Yeah. So I said, I was like, oh, I don't know how much of this I'm going to eat. Just try it. Tastes like chicken. I don't know what raw chicken tastes like. <laughs> What are you going to do? You, you've you obviously you taken do? care of yourself. You're a survivor. What food do you take on the road when uh, when you're on the sprinter or on the bus or whatever? Oh, um, look, you know, it's it's um, because I fly, it mm-hmm. kind of limits, you know, on all these dates, I kind of fly. Uh, I kind of limits what I take. I try to uh, eat local to it, you know, and non-chain. That's the best I can do, really. Yeah. You know, I mean, and you'd be surprised that it was funny because just think about this the other day that uh, we did a swim through these cities in uh, um, in California, right? And like Bakersfield. When was the last time you were in Bakersfield? You know? I mean, I yeah. was surprised they were doing a show there, right? But there was, I mean, I, I was calling it the taco capital of the United States. It's like there was a truck or a restaurant on every corner with tacos that were world class, right? And it's sort of like, uh, you know, I I shy away from uh, from eating um, uh, a lot of red meat, but you know, when you get, uh, you know, some uh, some good tacos with some good shredded beef in there, carne asada, you know, I mean, it's like you only live once, might as well check it out, mm-hmm. you know good chili good bowl of chili or something like that it's good you know it was only ramona uh california never been there right fantastic food yeah it's kind of somewhere between bakersfield and agora hills (laughs) okay you know i I don't know you know that was another where is this edge of the desert are you are you at these places because of casinos uh some but not always yeah you know i mean um Casino, uh, here's a, here's an interesting uh, sidelight, right? With a little, a little Steely Dan inside info, right? They, uh, when you do these casinos, usually the primary guys like Walter and Donald, they get a, a meal stipend that they could sign to their room, okay? Right? And they'd also have a, a hotel room. It was part of the deal, right? They saw some, uh, you know, uh, some TV show about, you know, how someone went in and scanned with a UV light, uh, scanned the room, and there's all these stains and stuff like that. So they would never go to uh, to the hotel rooms, right? And they would never eat in the um, uh, uh, in the casino either, because for the most part, they tended to stay at at a Four Seasons, okay. you know, Good for wherever them. they could. Yeah. Right? That's what I say, right? And they would, you know eat there or whatever but they would say they would say to me and uh, and my friend rich neeson who's uh uh another, another tour manager for, uh, recovering sound engineer and a wonderful bass player uh they say like i go really you got this meal stipend and go you guys use it and we go okay so we find the most you know the most expensive restaurant in the casino and have them deliver it backstage to us right a lot of times i was staged right eating eating a an incredibly expensive piece of filet mignon during the show. <laughs> and I'd, share, I'd share it with the stage right guys because uh, Walter had two guitar techs because there were so many instruments and so many you know changes. Yeah. Oh, man. Let me tell you, repatching amps and stuff in the middle of a song, not my idea of a good time. At one point, he decided that I tuned his guitars better than his guitar tech, and he demanded that I be tuning his guitars i think this was some kind of punishment for something i said right <laughs> really it really it altered the relationship between the guitar tech and me because that guitar tech 
uh, his name was Skip Gildersleeve, right? Uh, he, he passed away a couple of years ago. He got me into Steely Dan. He got me the Steely Dan gig, right? So all of a sudden there's like, you know, and all I could say is like, listen, you just have to pay attention. His right hand is so heavy that in order for you to tune his guitars, you have to hit the strings really hard, right? And plus he made a capital mistake that he, uh, of saying to Becker that, all strings are the same, right? They're all made by the same company. And Becker lost, uh, you know, uh, confidence in him, right? So he said, no, you will tune my guitars. And I went, great. I'm tuning guitars all the time during the show and taking bites of an expensive boy mignon. Nice. <laughs> what, yeah. was, what was Becker's string preference? Um, as far as, as what, gauge? What, did, what was it? Or, yeah, what was he using? Um, the Dario. Mm-hmm. Uh, a ten to, uh, a ten to forty six that was standard. Sometimes they'd go heavier depending on the guitar. Mm-hmm. There were times he did some really weird things by using really big strings and uh, tuning the guitar down a half step and and uh, or a whole step and then just transposing it. I think that was more of a mental exercise for him than anything else. You know, went through a flat wound string thing at one point. Interesting thing with him was with so many. First of all, he hated brand new strings because of the finger squeak thing, right? Sure. He uh, and he had, he had an, uh, you know a large amount of instruments, so he really didn't. Ha- and he didn't sweat. And here's a real insight: the guy did not sweat in any way. You know, his hands never got sweaty. I never saw him sweat on stage. Really unusual among. I mean, just he's a fucking alien. That's all. You know, he was put here by you know. <laughs> people from the grays put him here or something. Um, so you didn't have, you, if you, at most, uh, three, four shows before a string change. Okay. And, um, you know, we, you know, sometimes the strings go heavier. Sometimes a couple of times you come off and go change the E and B strings. You're like, Ooh, that's interesting. You know, he had Floyd Rose guitars that the Floyd Roses were blocked because he liked the fine tuners. Uh-huh. You know, yeah. We could make like some kind of, sometimes, I'm telling you, the guy had a really, really good ear. Sometimes you'd see him fussing around with the fine tuners on a Floyd Rose guitar. And I go, what's the deal? The guitar sounded fine to me. He goes, well, there's this chord that's high up uh, in this song, you know, and I found that if I really, if I sharpen the G string just a hair, it sounds more in tune higher up. And I was like, God bless you. Thank God I don't have that. I, I think it's a persecute, you know. It's, yeah, it'd be painful. It would drive me nuts, yeah. you know what I mean? But there you go. It's a guy who spent a year making a record. You know, so. Do you remember the last guitar-related thing you guys geeked out on together? Um, let me think about that. Uh, I can tell you the, la- the, the last guitar he bought. Sure. Um, was, was a guitar... Uh, uh, built by uh, it wasn't built by him. It was uh, Mark Jenny. You know who Mark Jenny is? No. Oh, you should know. You should, should know. We'll discuss that later. Okay. Mark Jenny has uh, MJT guitars. He's out in in uh, in Missouri, okay. right? He does like more very traditional Fender finishes. Mm-hmm. The painting guy. He started. Ma- he may. You know. He started doing things like uh, like. We had this discussion once about pushing the boundaries, you know, how traditional, you know, strats and telly, strats and telly. So I started making, started making a Firebird body with a Telecaster bridge on it. Right? All right. Yeah. And so, and, uh, oh, shit, we shouldn't, you know, you said other luthiers, Brian Monty, uh, uh, up in Canada. Um, uh, there's more. There, I want to get more. This guitar had a Brian Monty a neck on a Mark Jenny body. Right. And uh, it was the last guitar he purchased before he got, uh, you know, before he wasn't, it was, he was uh, homebound. Mm. And um, it was interesting, you know, uh, that was, we were geeking over that. And uh, he, you know, so we didn't always agree on things either. He really, you know, he, he was a big fan of CP Thornton guitars. He had like seven or eight of them. Right. They were very, very nice instruments, but they did not appeal to me. And for some reason, just uh, aesthetically, weren't they just didn't do it for me, right? Uh, but he's still a wonderful guy. He's just he used to send us maple syrup from Maine once nice. a year. Yeah, uh, it was kind of interesting. But 
Well, you know, he, it was a pedal guy who who never used pedals uh, in one song. I pedal in one song. Mm-hmm. That's all. It's a, I think it was a way of spending the time. You know, because we had pedal boards for the hotel, pedal boards for the dressing room, you know, and he loved fooling around with effects. When you say he has a pedal board for the hotel, did he have like a setup for his Four Seasons room that? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. What was that like? At one point, oh, it was it, 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 The amp varied, okay. right? And because we, you know, uh, the worst thing that would ever happen is like, I want this amp in my hotel, you know, like, oh, here we go. And sometimes you have to go, listen. It's we're in a private jet. There's nowhere to put a four by 12 in a private jet. Okay. You know, so, uh, so you're going to have to, the biggest, the best we can do is a two by 12 cabinet. Right. Okay. Cause, but if we were based in a city, like we spent, I spent five weeks in Chicago one time in the same hotel in the St. Regis. Right. So then you could have, you send it, Send some, send the runner over and bring me this, and we'd have all this stuff. Right, we had Pro Tools set up, we had uh, pedal boards, and and I see him play that loud in the hotels. Uh, okay. And like, he always always get a. He didn't play that loud to begin with, right? He used to freak out when I would test stuff out by turning it up. Do you really have to do that? And I go, yes. You know, I you need to hear what an amp sounds like when you're really pushing power tubes. You know, because uh, he he didn't play loud at all. A lot of times it was, uh, you know, he'd have a Dr. Z amp, maybe a uh, a satellite amp. At one point he had a uh, um, a little Ampeg jet, uh, which was really great uh, until it, uh, um, um, what you call it, a driver dropped it, taken out of the back of an SUV. And it was like, it was never the same from that point on something in it changed and it was never the same and sometimes he bought that at one point he got into these uh fender supersonics mm-hmm. right and fairly new kind of like i was like okay whatever it works for him you know he, he had a goal in mind that that you know that uh we used to say he could make every amp sound if he worked at it he could make every amp sound exactly what he wanted to do and you wouldn't be in a blindfold test you wouldn't be able to tell which was which yeah. it's kind of weird in a way but you know it is something that you know i'll get hey, listen if you if you have a sound that makes you able to comfortably express yourself playing wise my judgment has nothing to do with it you know what I mean? It may not work for me, but if it works for you and allows you to play the way you want to play, good for you. You know. And I guess a, a postscript to that would be: it's like don't obsess too much about gear. Play music. You know. I mean, I, it, it's like, especially now. You know, it's like uh, where there are no shows. This is your time to entertain. You know. To, you know. I know too many people who just sit there and read shit on the internet and and like whoa. You know, and like, don't even think about it. You know, it's a, just play, you know, get out there and play. Because the more you play, the better you'll get at it. And you'll realize that whether it's Pal Faro or Barbinga, it really is not going to impact you all that much, you know, when, you know, to, you know, because you're playing to, to people who really don't care if your guitar is made by Paul Reed Smith or by Fender or by, you know, uh, Gibson or uh, Saul Cole. Mm-hmm. Right, he's a particular great, favorite yeah. of mine. It was a, so he's a great builder. He his history is astounding. Right, as yeah. far as playing and and, and all, I went to. Did I tell you this the last time I went to a no. thing at the New School, where they were doing a thing about American craftsmen, right? And uh, I saw in the paper, you know, online that they were you know, they were bringing noted luthier Saul Cole to speak about his journey through luthery. Which was uh, which was mind bending. The reason Walter Becker did not own one is that he kind of builds to order, and it's hard to find. You know, uh, you know, he is a very impatient guy. You know, it's like if you're going to bring you know bring a guitar for him to buy, and he will buy it. You know, but um, he there was never you know everything was like he was you know backordered on building these guitars. You don't the only place I've ever seen his guitars used were in Portland. You know what I mean? Where I went to some some music store there, and I was like, "Look at that!" There's like, you know, uh, 
Because, you know, what more can you say? People who buy them usually don't let them go. You know, so it's like, he's a good guy too. I, I had him, I came, uh, he came down to an Ace Frehley show in Portland. I let him sit at the console. I go, push the solos. <laughs> <laughs> That's fun. <laughs> Uh, it was fun, and the thing you, I got, it was the funny thing, and this happens a lot with Ace Frehley. If you push the fader and nothing happens, he's just playing so loud that <laughs> he he can be louder than the PA. You know, I go, you keep going, you'll get, you'll eventually hear a change. Because you know, when you let people touch a console, they're very like you know, it's like a, yeah, oh, it's like piloting oh, a plane. Oh, I yeah. go, just push it up until you can hear it. Okay, this is not rocket science. Here. Uh, Anything else? Uh, yeah, one more question. Y- you famously have talked about all these crazy side projects that Walter Becker did, including right. now it turns out he's moving pedal boards around into Four Seasons hotels and doing God knows what right. music in there. Mm-hmm. You've mm-hmm. probably also heard all sorts of other well-known musicians noodling backstage, doing something that we're not, we don't, we don't know them for that. What of these, right. you know? Were, a, were any of these Walter Becker side projects, should they see the light of day? Were any really fascinating to you musically? Or were they just kind of thought experiments? And, and were there any other musicians like that who... Well, the, he he was... At one point, he was exploring electronica, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And he worked a year on this project, right? It was never finished, right? And then he dropped his laptop, and uh, I, I said, listen, you know, because I had the hard drives done and, and like, uh, I go, you didn't back it up. He goes, no, I, I didn't back it up. And I was like, I go, I know, I know, listen, we're in New York. If there's anybody who could lift that data out of that, they'll be either here in San Francisco. And I know people there too. And he goes, you want, I go, you want me to lift it? And he says, nah, if I can't remember it, it's not any good. Right, so that that sits in somewhere in a stack of laptops in a storage facility somewhere that will probably never be repaired or whatever, unless his uh, unless his wife, his uh, his widow actually decides to go dig. Because I she didn't even wasn't even aware. She goes, "What laptop was it on?" I go, "Like, I don't know." I goes, "Like, it, you know, there was so many laptops. You know, sometimes it was like a." A MacBook Air, sometimes a MacBook Pro, you know, I don't know what, you know, he was very secretive about stuff like that. You know, I felt kind of like, you know, he used to drive around in a, uh, in a car in like a, you know, a, a black, black Lincoln with a driver and he would do programming in the back seat uh, for, for uh, percussion tracks and things like that. And some of them sounded like machine shops because he, he would, Replay, he didn't want to use traditional drum sounds and he was using shit like the slamming of a car door and all these kind of weird samples and stuff. Mm-hmm. It was a really interesting project. But, you know, uh, I, like I, I think I said the last time, it was just that he found it interesting because there was no real song form. You know, it was just a building thing that they would have these things going and then they would step it up to some other kind of hypnotic rhythmic thing and then something uh go higher than that i played guitar on a couple of these tracks uh mainly because i i did you know i was good at the the really you know making my guitar sound like a fire engine or a jet plane or something like that and he wanted these non-traditional sounds he was really loved the blues and wanted to do a blues album we didn't get very far on that and because uh, it, it kept going like Ah, you know, I got to find some, some, some really deeper things. I don't want to do rock me baby or, you know, I don't, you know, or any of that stuff, but I, he, what he loved the blues, you know, and uh, there was some other stuff. We had, he and I had a doom band called chefs of the future that, um, that, yeah, right. <laughs> That's from the honeymoon. Right. And it was funny cause I went to get the, uh, uh, the domain name and somebody had taken the domain name that basically killed the project. If it can't be called, he goes, you write the music. That's because I turned him on to the band's son. Yeah. Right? You familiar with them? I, yeah, I am familiar with yeah. them. I'm sure. Aren't they from your neighborhood? And they're scattered like about. I was trying to get a uh, toss on the amplifier podcast, but yeah. Mm. Yeah. They were, uh, you know, 
And that was an accident. I was getting out of the car and he goes, where can I, you know, learn more about that Model T amp of yours? I go, just Google Sun. And I slammed the door and I went, oh, I should have said Sun amp. Next day he came in, he goes, this band. He goes, it's insane. He goes, they don't have a drummer. And I go, yep, no drummer. He goes, <laughs> he goes, who's playing bass? And he goes, it's two guitar. I go, it's two guitar players. And he was like, whoa. So it's like future music, you know, like some kind of like open some kind of door in his head. And we got into some droney things, right? And it was kind of interesting, you know. So were the future chefs good? Domain aside? Um, it was, you know, I don't know. I don't know how to judge. It didn't get far enough uh, to to be more than a conceptual thing or to, you know, irritate people at SIR <laughs> at where his studio was, right? You know, where he gets some kind of drone thing going, right? And one of his previous uh, guitar techs was uh, Stuart Herwood, who was uh, Lou Reed's long-serving tech, right? Mm -hmm. And Lou did this thing called the drones, right? Where he'd have like a couple of guitars, like five guitars, amplifiers they're all tuned in an interesting way and he would kind of like get these these drones going they still do this to this day and so it's really like an art installation where Stuart goes there with the guitars and the amps and he knows how it was set up and he would just do this drone thing and sometimes we'd experiment with that with feedback and drones and shooting stuff down the hallway so the other people in the building get really mad and sometimes we do it really late at night and sometimes it'd be really loud, like a hundred watt high watt stack with a guitar tuned down to, you know, to like A or something like that. And just, he's just droning away. But um, crazy. That, I don't even think that exists on, on a laptop. Okay. Anywhere. It was kind of fun, you know? I was like, oh, who got to name the songs? Oh, Oh, he's got, he was the lyric guy, definitely. Oh. I was like, oh, you take care of that. You know, what should we write about? And we said, let's write about, you know, common themes. He goes, oh, love and hate? How about that? And I go, perfect. Let's go with hate. <laughs> <laughs> There's enough of that around. Maybe we can neutralize it. What other what other well-known players were uh, were good at something we wouldn't know that they were good at? Was there somebody, was oh, some rock and roller like into Fahey or like really good or, or whatever? Oh, more than you, more than you think. Well, you know, there, um, Brad Whitford, uh, he's a Berkeley School of Music, mm -hmm. wonderful player, can play with anybody, anybody. You know, you pop him in with Frank Zappa, he'd be fine. You pop him in, uh, you know, with a country band, he, you know, a wonderful player, really spectacular, right? Um, Walter Becker is a bass player, hmm. right? Phenomenal. Phenomenal, man. I mean, it's like you, you put something would come on and he's, you know, like sometimes he'd start, uh, you know, he'd come up with some rhythm thing. And the first thing he'd do is like, give me a bass. And then he'd start playing and I'd be going like, wow, you are really good. And he, he's like a Chuck Rainey fan. Right. And, uh, yeah, he would, he had Chuck come down to shows and he would bring him out on stage and introduce him. He says, there would be no Steely Dan and no Walter Becker without this guy. Right. And, uh, Chuck had had a stroke and he, he helped him out, uh, uh, a lot. And, he had, and, uh, I give, you know, give, you know, somebody, Alex Skrolnik from, uh, Testament way, way super good guitar player, you know, jazz guitar player. Right. Becker could play jazz guitar like nobody's business. You know what I mean? Like I was like, wow, I can't, you know, I couldn't even conceive of some of these chord things. He'd go, Hey, you know, this chord, that was a, a big quiz, you know, this chord. And I'm like, I've never even seen that chord much less. Well, come on. I am not, you know, he as heavily schooled in, in, in music theory as he was. And it was like, uh, he was continually trying to explain things. Uh, the fact that I knew a diminished, new diminished chords was, was like flabbergasting to him. Yeah. And I was like, goes, where'd you learn that? And I go from a, a who song. He was a Who fan too. Like, ah, blah blah blah. You know, but I, you learn a lot from from all these guys. You know, either from watching them or listening to them. You know, and, and like, and believe me, you know, a lot of them they don't. You know, what they 
become famous for is not particularly what floats their boat anymore because they grow up, you know, or they move forward, you know, and it's sort of, you know, I mean, I've heard, I've heard, I heard Ed Van Halen play stuff that was really out of character from him. Um, you know, uh, the, a lot of these guys are much broader players, especially if they've been around a long time. Sure. You know, I mean, there are some guys who just, you get to a certain point and you just stop learning and it becomes a skill that you have. You know, it's like the difference between a carpenter and a sculptor, you know, I mean, like some people take it to another place. Other people just, just like, you know, you know, I play the blues and, you know, that's it. That's what, that makes them happy. And that's all they want to do. You know, so good for them. Mm-hmm. Well, circling it back mm-hmm. to you before I say goodbye, uh, did you ever end up getting a guitar at the uh, place you're quarantining at? And, and what do you miss the most? What, what after this do you want to jump back into? Um, that's interesting. Yes, I did. I did, <laughs> I did wind up, uh, um, uh, me and my uh, and my friend Annie, right? We've been in this quarantine thing down in the Deborah Du Colony. At one point, first we bought uh, we bought an acoustic guitar, a Chinese acoustic, okay. um, um, that was was very interesting instrument because um, oh god, it was called a Walden, right? And it was uh, the the body design. One of the designers was this was a very famous acoustic guitar builder from San Francisco. He tried making solid body guitars in, uh, uh, in the late seventies called guitar research and design or GRD. And they're fabulous, fabulous, well-made instruments, but they were just, they just didn't, it didn't fly. I, uh, I, I apologize to him in advance. I can't remember his name. And the, I bought this, we bought this guitar in a guitar center uh, for like, a hundred dollars, right? And I'm going. It better have a case, <laughs> and uh, and it's a very nice guitar, right? And uh, but I don't play acoustic guitar, so I, I was taking a break. I didn't mind not having a guitar because mm-hmm. I kind of wanted to clear my head uh, on, on a lot of subjects, right? And then um, we did buy a uh, an Ibanez Starfield, which is an early '90s Japanese manufactured. Um, uh, solid body guitar. And by that point, my, my calluses had gotten really soft. And so I didn't play it all that much, you know what I mean? Like, uh, and I go like, shit, I just bought a guitar and now I got to buy an amp. So, uh, I bought a boss. I had to go back and forth beside, uh, uh, I bought a boss, uh, 50 watt, uh, amp that has like all kind of, you know, uh, kind of like an uh, inexpensive profiling, you know, mm-hmm. modeling, had a bunch yeah. of different sounds. It was loud enough to to wake the neighbors, you know. And, but to be to be honest about it, I was uh, I, I was like taking a, a good break because it's like restarting your computer or restarting your phone, you know. All of a sudden, th- you know, um, things that seemed important didn't seem so important. And I was really trying to clear my head and figure out where I wanted to go in the next five, two years, five years and 10 years, mm-hmm. you know, cause uh, like, uh, I, I don't see, um, uh, full scale touring being a big part of my life, uh, in the future yeah. anymore. I love mixing live music. Right. And I, I enjoy some of the clients, uh, uh, most of the clients that I have now, because I do enjoy that, and I like the way they're doing, and it's fun, right? I do an all-girl Led Zeppelin band called Led Zeppelin, right? I always wanted to mix Led Zeppelin, never got the chance. Well, I actually got to mix the song, but that's a whole other story. Um, and <laughs> You're just going to leave us hanging, huh? Were, <laughs> well, okay, what it was, they were telling, they're, they're, I was at the, the last ever Led Zeppelin show in Oakland, California, right? And the PA provider was Shoko, and I was using a British company for Aerosmith, and they were trying to, uh, uh, you know, you know, you should use this PA. And I was like, when can I take it for a test drive? And they just said, go ahead, mix the song. Right. So I stepped up and, and it's like, you really don't. But by, by that point in the show, everything's in place. The plane's in the air. You know, the hardest part is getting it together in the first song. Right. And I wasn't there for that. And, and like I knew what it was. And I was in a, you know, big outdoor co- uh, arena, a coliseum, you know, and it was like 
I pushed a couple, you know, pushed a couple of faders and listened to a couple of things, and that was it. I don't really like that. That was my I mixed one song. I mixed one song for ZZ Top once on the, in the same thing when they were wanted to uh, take a ride. You know, it's like it's a ZZ band. What do you do? You're pushing the guitar solo up and down. You know, it's like okay, huh? but um, that makes for a good story. But the girls, I like the girls that play the stuff really good. And they're a lot more fun to hang out with than a bunch of uh, guys, you know, trying to, to, you know, play this music. And they've been, at, I've been actually doing, uh, you know, mixing shows for them for 10 years. So I know the stuff really well. And uh, they know the stuff really well. And they do a good job and they, they work, you know, they, they work mostly in the Northeast. But it's, you know, it's good fun. And I enjoy that. I miss, I mix a lot of, uh, you know, new bands try and help them out i figured that you know you got to give back too you know i mean I'm, i've been i've been very successful you know and i enjoy what i do and i try and help people you know i mean like you got a question send me a message i'll try and help you out you know i mean like don't ask me to defend paul reed smith though i'll just block you <laughs> <laughs> on that note <laughs> <laughs> Buy from smaller companies. Right? It's really some poor craftsmanship. That's that's my. I, I really, I got Becker into that right, and I've been. You know, when I when I realized what was available to to the average person from like Charvel, DC Rich, Hamer, you know, Dean, those guys who were were like they were like the second wave. They were taking everything they liked about uh, the old guitars and putting them into you know new guitars. Right. And Alembic, those guys, you know, I mean, it's like, you you know, right now, I mean, like, oh, they're going to love this. It's like all these, you know, Gibson and Fender, they're just recycling the stuff that made them popular in the 50s. You know, you're not going to see anything real. You know, it's like Gibson, all they want to do is they want to make their, you know, uh, they want to make their 59 reissues because they make bank on that. And then they're making these these little, uh, like, you know, double cutaway juniors that have a, a pickup mounted on a pick guard, and, you know, the pickup and the control are all mounted on a pick guard. It's like 800 bucks. That's a nice entry level guitar, I think, you know, and Fender, I mean, like they're doing this weird gene splicing thing. Have you seen some of their, you know, where they, let's, let's make a jazz master Stratocaster. Mm -hmm. Like what? You know what I mean? It's like, I hate that vibrato and I don't, you know, why would you do that? You know, I mean, like to stand out from the crowd, you know, I'm, I don't get it. You know, I guess it works for them. They're a big, you know, gigantic company. You know, I, really, I mean, like when they used to put out catalogs, it was like a half inch thick and it was all variations on the theme. Oh, I'll never do any work for them again, but that's okay. To, you know, what could I say? Uh, but once again, kids, Send Jason some questions. I'll try to be able to... Right. Yeah. We'll, we'll oh, just make another, this a recurring thing. Too long. Too long. It's all right. Um, well, thanks for the invitation. And uh, and I look forward to, you know, uh, being a little more, you know, we get some good questions. You know, we don't go into the history of, of bands too much. If you just want to stick to the guitar, you know, a little more guitar centric, I swear I can do answer five questions in under an hour. All right. Well, we we like how it's been going so far, but thank you, Night Bob. Well, I know, I it's like, I know, but I, I'm I'm like trying to be more. You know, sometimes you're just like, you know what, you know, if you want to know about that. Go to this podcast for I talk an hour <laughs> sure. about that. You know, sure. it's like go to somebody else. You know, it's like uh, I'll tell everybody if you want to, not to take people away from you, but it's it's a static site right now. But if you want to learn a lot of stuff about builders and players and stuff like that, go to Roadie Free Radio. Right. Yeah. Uh, he has 150 interviews, right, including a very interesting Matt Humanoff interview and. Mitch Colby has a little interview there. If you're an amp guy, right? There's a Roger Sadowski interview that, that, that's uh, interesting, and they're a lot. They're usually about an hour and and change, right? And um, you know, it's a, it's like just keep keep searching, you know, keep searching for info and learn and uh, learn about your learn about your gear and play, 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 play. You know, get out and play, play with your friends, get together, be socially distant. Wear a mask, 
strum some songs that mean something to you, you know, because it, it's like, it really, it help, it'll make you feel better. It'll make, you know, you know it really, it, it spreads joy. And, and, and we're in a world right now that doesn't have a lot of joy, especially today. And, um, you know, so fight the good fight, as Patti Smith would say. Uh, and just uh, music, music will make you better. Thanks, Night How Bob. That? That was perfect. Jason, thanks again. Stay in touch. All right. Yeah, right. yeah you, you too. Know. All right, that was my talk with Night Bob. I hope you enjoyed it. I love that guy, and I hope he can get back to work soon. I hope we can all get back to work and normalcy soon. Uh, everybody out there, please stay safe. Please mask up, and uh, please keep the feedback coming. And thank you for listening to the Fretboard Journal podcast. 